Kathy Wood appeared on CNBC today to discuss mounting short positions on ARK Invest Innovation ETF. She also talked about crypto, inflation, and so much more. What's up, Ape Nation? Welcome back to the channel. Before we get started, please smash the like button so we can get this video out to more people. And while you're down there, please consider subscribing. It's free and you can always change your mind. All right, let's listen in to what Kathy Wood had to say. And then I want to mention a few things after that. DC. In the meantime, hedge funds jumping ship and Investors, including Michael Burry, placing millions of put contracts against Kathy Wood's ARK Innovation ETF. The fund grew a whopping 149% in 2020, this year down just about six. She hit back, said Burry doesn't understand the explosive growth in innovation investing right now. ARK Invest founder and CEO Kathy Wood joins us here on Tech Chat this morning. Kathy, always good to have you. Thanks for the time. Thank you for inviting me, Carl. Always happy to be here. So let's talk about the short community at large. What is your message to them right now? Well, you know what, when uh, I see such negative sentiment out there, especially when it uh, comes to valuation and longer uh, time horizons, investment time horizons, uh, I actually feel a, a, a little more comfortable. I like bad news and maybe uh, news that's uh, uh, not, new, the discounting is is worse now than the news actually will be. I actually feel better in that kind of environment for, for our strategies. Uh, I don't think we're in a bubble, which is what I think many bears think we are. Um, a, in a bubble, and I remember the late 90s, uh, you know, our strategy would have been cheered on, rah, 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 go, go get them, <laughs> right? You know, and you remember the leapfrogging of analysts uh, making estimates one higher than the other, price targets one higher than the other. We have nothing like that right now. In fact, you see a lot of uh, IPOs or SPACs coming out and falling to earth. We couldn't be further away from a bubble. And the reason for that is the innovation around which we have centered our research Research. Uh, the the these five platforms: DNA sequencing, robotics, energy storage, artificial intelligence, and blockchain technology, are barely off the ground. The seeds for all of these platforms were planted in the 20 years that ended in the tech and telecom bust. Uh, and ended in tears, and that, and there's a lot of muscle memory around that. But that's not what's going on right now. The seeds planted back then are beginning to flourish now, and it's just beginning with, with five platforms involving 14 different technologies, all of which are about to experience S-curves and feed one another's S-curves. I don't think the market's ready for this. That's what I meant. Uh, we, we're st we've dedicated our research and investing to innovation because we think we've never been at a more uh, uh, provocative time for innovation right. in history. Uh and I do want to get to how some of those forces are playing out on your macro thesis, uh, which you've talked about a lot in recent months. But as, to, as far as the shorts go in terms of how they're how they have their eyes set on ARC specifically, is it just do you think is it general macro bearishness or does it have something more to do with your ability to analyze all these companies that you're now in and stay on top of that game? I, I actually think it's more of a macro call. I I I I um when I read the bearish analyses, they seem to be centered on inflation and interest rates going higher, uh, which will kill valuations. And if anything, uh, as, as you mentioned, Carl, we're focused on the deflationary forces uh, that are building up in the economy. And I think that's going to be the shocker out there, that uh, deflation is the greater risk now, not inflation. And, and not all deflation is bad. There's really good deflation associated with these technologically enabled uh, uh, platforms. Uh, they're, they follow learning curves, which are characterized by declining costs and prices uh, and uh, enables uh, more and more sectors to have access to these powerful new technologies. So that's good deflation. Uh, the bad deflation is going to be associated with companies 
who's uh, who, who paid too much attention to short term oriented shareholders who wanted their profits now, wanted their dividends mm. now and did not want companies to sacrifice short term profitability in order to capitalize on some of these massive trends that we see building. They are going to be stuck with obsolete products. And yet in the meantime, they've leveraged up uh, their balance sheets to buy back sh- sales uh, and satisfy short-term oriented shareholders. How are they going to uh, service that debt? They're going to have to cut prices of these products and services that are not going to be as popular in the future as they have been in the past. And then the third source of deflation, which is really starting to come through now in a noticeable way, started in mid-May uh, when lumber prices broke. We're seeing commodity price uh, deflation. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, we've gone from, uh, we've lumber prices have been cut to one third, less than one third mm-hmm. of their yeah. peak, 1711 to four, 500 right now. You've got copper down uh, roughly 15%, 15 to 20%. You now have oil down nearly 15 to 20%. Uh, and th- I think the cream of the crop here, and the reason this may be happening and may accelerate to the downside is the dollar is going up. And that of course mm-hmm. might be associated mm-hmm. with what's going on in China. Kathy, good morning. It's Deirdre. Uh, I know you've talked about commodity prices before, and I wonder if you're willing to mention any of the companies or industries that you're referring to, those that are perhaps sacrificing those long-term innovations that you're not a fan of. Well, I, I think that uh, if, if when we look at the S&P 500, for example, uh, we think that because of technology changes and uh, importantly, that uh, a lot of industries are in harm's way. Energy certainly is uh, because of electric vehicles and the move towards uh, autonomous electric. Uh, and you can throw in autos and any mm. a- and the auto supply chain. Uh, they're scrambling to try and get into this new world. It's going to be very difficult. Even when you think of retail, uh, many many investors, I'm sure, think, oh, okay, well. We've seen the destruction there. Uh, We think it's just begun in a way because uh, online retail sales have only hit 20% of total sales here in the United States. When a trend moves from 10 through 20%, it's usually moving into overdrive. So we think a a lot, a much higher percentage of sales will uh, will be online. So even retail right. and any, any business that can be done online. Financial services, I would say digital mm-hmm. wallets, DeFi, a uh, big problem, a big challenge for financial services. Right. And Kathy, a few moments ago, you talked about the innovative way that you guys at ARC structure your research. And I wonder, what does someone shorting ARC miss about your approach, the advantages or perhaps the differences of being an ETF versus, say, a hedge fund? I don't think the wrapper uh, matters that much. I I think uh, our research is the differentiator. And uh, and the way we've set up our research department is a differentiator. Unlike traditional asset management firms, our analysts do not follow sectors. Uh, They follow technologies, the 14 different technologies that I mentioned involved in these five major innovation platforms. So they are technology specialists and they are generalists when it comes to sectors. So we have a very good idea based on our analysis of these technologies and Wright's Law. Wright's Law, we've centered our research around it. Uh, Wright's Law is a relative of Moore's Law. Uh, But Moore's Law is a function of time. Wright's Law is a function of units. And Wright's Law has worked better in the semiconductor industry recently than Moore's Law has. Uh, So we think that's a very important uh, gauge of how quickly these costs are going to decline over time. And uh, we also pay a lot of attention to price elasticity of demand. At what point in this cost or in price decline trajectory, will uh, new sectors open up to these new technologies? Uh, and so I think what we are able to see is expon- uh, our exponential growth trends that are not priced into the market. I'll give you the uh, easiest example. Last year, uh, 
EV sales were 2.2 million units around the world. We think based on uh, the declining costs of battery pack systems uh, that uh, uh, that electric vehicle prices will drop below gas powered prices uh, in a, a year or so. They're already lower from a total uh, cost of ownership uh, point of view. So we think that 2.2 million will be 40 million in five years, in 2025, not even five years. No one is forecasting that. So our, the starting point from the top down, using rights law, getting a sense of how quickly the costs associated with these technology are, uh, technologies are falling and how quickly, therefore, they will be taken up by more and more sectors and industries over time. Kathy, two things on China. One is, I'm curious why you're drawing such a direct line to dollar strength and China. The other would be, you had said recently you thought China names did deserve a reset, but after all of these new regs and, and President Xi talking about common prosperity, are some of these names in China now truly uninvestable? Um, well, we have never said uh, the Chinese names are uninvestable. What we have said is, because of the social engineering uh, it seems, or re-engineering that's taking place in China, that the valuations associated with these companies uh, are, are damaged, and, and we don't think they're going to go up uh, uh, anytime soon. Linking to the, the dollar to China, what we're saying is there it has been uh, a capital reallocation away from China uh, to, you might say, the dollar's a flight to safety currency. You might say Bitcoin is uh, a flight to safety currency as well. Both have done well recently, and, and I would link that uh, to China in some measure. Uh, in fact, you know, there's an article today on, um, on Bloomberg about uh, the inability of the Chinese population to get, uh, as they are leaving the country, to get their retirement funds out. You know, that's... Um, that's pretty uh, daunting, I think, for uh, those of us in the in the asset management world uh, uh, to consider as we're trying to figure out is is China investable. The one thing I will say is China wants to win. Uh, the only way they're going to win is if they embrace innovation uh, as aggressively as uh, or more aggressively than any other country. And they are trying to do that, but I, I fear for them that uh, becoming more insular uh, is, is going to harm uh, their, their speed uh, in, in terms of innovation. So, you know, we're, we're weighing this back and forth. And I would say nationalizing an industry like the online education industry uh, is uh, that's going to sear our memories for a long time. That could happen wow. to any industry. Right. I wonder, what do you say to those who wonder why, if there are these fraying elements of capital in and out of China, why some of our own companies for whom China is a tentpole, I'm thinking of Apple and Nike just as a couple of examples, why they don't seem to be reflecting uh, that, kind of, that kind of fear? Well, we don't know what the talk in the boardrooms is, and we also don't know what the dialogue between those companies and and the government is. I, I know uh, we can tell just by looking at what Tesla is doing in China, that it is listening very closely to what the government is saying. Safety is paramount uh, and um, it is taking more precautions, I think, than might otherwise uh, have been the case. And I think the other side of this is China wants uh, to manufacture very high-end goods. It does not want to be considered the commoditizer of, uh, of the world. And so I know that uh, Tesla, Apple, Nike, they're all exporting from China, uh, which says something about China's manufacturing prowess. Uh, and if you are listening to uh, President Xi Jinping these days, he's saying we need to uh, accelerate our, um, our movement up the stack in terms of quality and design when it comes to manufacturing. So uh, I think they are serving the, uh, uh, part of the Chinese government's purpose in some way, and uh, the labor costs still are much lower in China, so uh, serving those companies well as, as well. 
Right. And we know that uh, they're trying to move up, especially when it comes to the design and manufacturing of semis. Uh, Kathy, I want to ask you about Robinhood, though. We got earnings last night and the CFO was asked about raising capital on the back of this retail interest. And he said that they don't have any plans to do so. But when I think about that, I think about Tesla, how it used its momentum to raise money, grow its business and the fundamentals. Would you encourage Robinhood or other names that you hold to raise money on the back of retail interest, especially companies that are looking to diversify their revenue? Um, well, well, in terms of uh, our companies, we are uh, very involved in the innovation space. Um, we are not afraid, uh, as an investor, we're not afraid of dilution if we, if we think they're doing it for the right reason. Tesla, very high fixed cost base. Robinhood, very different, very low fixed cost base. So they're a little bit night and day. We were, um, we we wanted Tesla uh, to, um, I'm not going to say to dilute us, but we wanted them to scale as quickly as possible because uh, we think if we're right on autonomous, uh, that they that Tesla could get the lion's share of that market, certainly in the United States. Uh, I think Robinhood is a very uh, different. They're moving very quickly. I don't think they need to uh, raise funds. Uh, maybe they'll make an acquisition to diversify internationally, which they seem to suggest uh, is um, is their strategy. Uh, that by that I mean their global expansion. I don't know if they'll raise. If they were making a sensible acquisition, uh, we wouldn't object to it at all. OK, I also want to know how you're thinking about the crypto space these days. We've seen sort of this explosion of stable coins. Regulators are looking at it. We've seen the popularity of stable coins like Tether and USDC on the rise that are not, in fact, backed one to one to the U.S. dollar. Does their rising function and utility, does it concern you at all, as well as their lack of transparency? Uh, well, well, I think that. Uh I think that there's so much more transparency in the crypto asset world than there is in the traditional financial services world. That, that's where I'll start. Uh, but I think that uh, the movement towards DeFi, which is really taking middlemen out of um, the financial services sector, taking the toll collectors out, cutting costs for traditional financial services companies and creating many opportunities for uh, new greenfield uh, opportunities for other companies. Uh, I think it's a uh, th this whole space is, you know, the vanguard of innovation, the likes of which we have not seen before. The internet gives us just a clue. Kathy, you know, one thing people wonder about uh, about ARC is uh, you have a non-traditional way of hiring analysts. We're in an interesting world right now in terms of uh, especially junior analysts as the big banks are throwing more money at them. But you hire from non-traditional tracks uh, and some wonder whether or not they are uh, w well enough steeped in traditional methods of, of valuing companies. The other thing we hear sometimes is that how many funds are too many? And at what point do people start to legitimately worry about ARC spreading itself too thin? Okay, uh, well, I consider our research and our analysts our secret weapons. Uh, and I say secret because uh, so, so much of what I read out there has no appreciation for how important it is when you're investing in innovation to hire uh, individuals with domain expertise and one foot in the new world. Coming out of college, uh, many of our analysts steeped in uh, genomics research. Our latest hire uh, just uh, uh, f finished a PhD program in genomics around agriculture. Uh, so having that domain expertise, I think is much more important than having an MBA. In fact, uh, we we seek the domain expertise with this thought in mind, and this this is harkens back to uh, the Sanford C Bernstein days, where they they would say, you know, it is much easier to hire uh, a, a rocket scientist uh, and to teach that rocket scientist how to read financials and understand valuation in the in the uh, equity market than it is to hire an MBA. And have the, and train that MBA uh, the same way our PhD uh, has been trained, uh, and it's not just coming out of school; it's actually industry. So I think we actually have a big competitive advantage relative 
to our right. peers because of our analysts. And one other thing, because of our open research ecosystem, we are pushing our research out. We give it away because we want to engage with and become a part of the communities who are innovating. Uh, we, mm -hmm. They love our analysis, sizing their markets and understanding the competitive dynamics. We love their analysis, understanding how these different technologies are evolving uh, and uh, who the are, winners are going to be. Are any of them looking at the gig economy? Because for a long time, companies in this space or the shared economy space like Uber, Lyft, Airbnb were considered disruptors, but I don't think that you guys have been buyers. So I wonder where you stand on this, especially as some of them you know, say that they're involved in autonomous technology and robotics? So uh, we call ourselves the first sharing economy company in the asset management space when it comes to research. Again, we're sharing. If you don't give, you don't get in the sharing economy. That's a little jog there. But um, no, we haven't uh, invested in, in this space yet. It doesn't mean we won't. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the opportunities uh, in our portfolio are there because uh, where we understand the uh, actual technologies and how they are going to decline in cost, what their learning curves are all about. Uh, and we feel many of them are more in their infancy than some of uh, the companies you mentioned, like Air Airbnb. Kathy, I'm sure it won't surprise you to hear that uh, everyone's listening to everything you're saying very closely. Uh, really good to have you. We always love getting a, 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 an insight into how you're thinking about things. Thanks so much for the time. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Deirdre. Guys, this interview with Kathy was very informative. She talked about many different things and essentially gave her take on the overall market. But I want to focus on short sellers like Michael Burry shorting ARK's innovation ETF because I think it says a lot about the current stock market as a whole. On one side, we have Kathy who is very confident that over the long term, the companies that ARK has invested in will grow and thrive beyond what many believe possible. And concurrently, she does not think we are in a stock market bubble. This is very interesting to me especially so given all the red flags that seem eerily similar to what was happening prior to the 08 crash. Inflation at or above 5% for three consecutive months. We just had a boatload of stimulus money printed. Roughly one third of all US dollars currently in circulation were printed in 2020 alone. We have a hot housing market with large firms buying up real estate like crazy. Margin debt is at astronomical levels. Reverse repos have been over $1 trillion day after day after day. And the list just keeps on going. Going. Now, I want to be very clear. I am not at all trying to instill fear into anyone, and I hope that Kathy Wood is right when she says that the market is not currently in a bubble. At the same time, though, I can definitely see why someone like Michael Burry, along with many others, are essentially shorting innovation right now. I could be wrong, but it seems that shorts are betting on an overall market correction, or even worse, a crash. Because think of it, why would you specifically short innovative companies whose industries are just in the beginning stages? and will be very important in the future. For example, I don't see DNA sequencing going anywhere. I don't see AI going away anytime soon. I don't see robotics, energy storage, or blockchain technologies going away anytime in the near future. If anything, these industries and these sectors are just getting started. And with this in mind, the only way that I can justify the idea of someone shorting these innovative companies is if the short sellers genuinely believed that a market crash or at least a market correction was on the table. Maybe I'm missing something, but that's the only way I can justify it in my mind. But again, I hope Kathy is right. I hope we are not in a bubble, and I hope that we do not have to worry about another financial crisis in the near future. That being said, it's important to consider both sides of the argument, be realistic with ourselves, and be prepared for whatever happens. And that does it for this video, guys. Please smash the like button so we can get this video out to more people. And while you're down there, please subscribe. It's free, and it helps us out tremendously. And until next time, remember why we hold.